Our guest today on the Strong Women podcast is Baronelle Stutzman, who's the owner of Arlene's Flowers in Washington State. You may recognize the name of this flower shop because it has been in the news on and off for eight years because of a lawsuit brought against Baronelle. Alliance Defending Freedom has come alongside her in this journey. And if you've listened to our podcast at all, you know we're huge fans of Alliance Defending Freedom. Baronelle's journey and posture of love and grace throughout this whole legal process has set an example for all of us that truth and love do go together and the truth is worth standing for. It's the loving thing to do. So we're so thrilled to introduce our listeners to Baronelle. Thank you so much, Baronelle, for coming. Oh, thank you for the privilege of being able to talk to you. Okay, Baronelle, before we get into the lawsuit and that whole story and what you've been going through the past eight years, we always love to start um, with our guests and just ask about where you grew up and your family and all that sort of thing, because we know it's so foundational to the women that we become uh, when we get older. So where did you grow up and what kind of home did you grow up in? Well, I was born in Springfield, Missouri. And I lived there about a year, and then we moved to Alcatraz. And my guard, my guard, my dad was a guard on Alcatraz, and oh so we leave. Yeah, isn't that exciting? Well, yeah, uh, it is. But anyway, uh, yeah, he was there during the big prison break in '45, I think it was. But anyway, oh my uh, then, gosh. Then we moved to the Tri Cities, and I've grown been here ever since. I have uh, one sister. I have, uh, well, we have eight kids and we have 25 grandkids and seven great grandkids. Wow. And, wow. Yeah. I was raised in a, in a, well, I was raised in a Christian home. I, my mom was a Christian. My dad was an atheist. So we were uh, at church every Sunday, whether we wanted to go or not. And uh, <laughs> so I, I grew up in the, the Baptist church, but I didn't really have a relationship with Christ till I met my husband, Daryl. And he asked me on a date one time, he said, how's your relationship with Jesus, with Christ? And uh, I wanted to be, you know, it was my, my date and I wanted to be nice. So I said, well, it's just fine. Thank you for asking. But in my <laughs> heart, I was saying, you little sawed off shrimp, he's six too. I said, how dare you? How dare you ask me how my relationship with Jesus Christ was? But uh, he was right to ask because I had one with the church, but I did not have one with Christ. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so did in in your dating with him, did he encourage that relationship with Christ or yeah, he he put me on the right track and he's been my my mentor and he when I get out of line, he puts me right back in line, which I deserve a lot. So <laughs> he's he's okay. my stronghold. Okay, so you have eight children, twenty five uh-huh. grandchildren, uh-huh. and how many greats? seven great seven greats that's amazing what a beautiful what a beautiful thing like you you're just surrounded aren't you we are we're so blessed and they're so fun and we have a great time together yeah okay so did you start tell us about how you started Arlene's flowers like where did that idea come from did you always enjoy arranging flowers I was never going to get in the floral business my mom bought a shop and then she asked me if I would deliver after work, which I did, which was absolutely awful. I am directionally <laughs> handicapped. I am so bad. I get lost in malls. <laughs> so that was, that was really short lived. And then little by little, I started working in the shop cleaning uh, flowers and cleaning bathrooms. And then I was eventually trained by uh, five excellent designers and went back to uh, design school and turned into be a full pledge floors, which I never thought I would be. Wow. So do you, is this Arlene's flower shop? Is that your mom's? Was that your mom's no. before? My mom bought it from a gal named Arlene and we kept the name. Well, mom mm-hmm. kept the name because it starts with an A. So it's first in the phone book and it had a good reputation. So we've just, it's been in business 47 years now. Wow. So you've had this flower shop for then how many years have you been running it? Uh, we've had it for 25, 25 years. Okay. And so leading up to this case, you, before the case started, you had customers that, um, 
we're obviously from all, all different walks of life, right? It's Absolutely. you are, you are a Christian yourself, but you had customers who were all different kinds of people and believed all sorts of things, of course. And um, so tell us about this customer, Rob, who was a friend of yours. Is that right? Yes. And I, I absolutely love Rob and I would wait on him for another 10 years if he came in, but he, uh, he had a great sense of humor and he loved artistic things. And he would come in and he'd say, uh, this is for Kurt's birthday. And this is what I'm thinking. And he'd pick out different faces and new things. And he would say, now just do your thing, just create. And I absolutely love that because you do a lot of bread and butter as they call it in the floral business. And, and he let me use my artistic ability to make something different and unique. And we had a great time. We got along awesome till the government stepped in and uh, I, I miss him. Wait, mm -hmm. let me, let's go back just a minute. Cause you mentioned Kurt, but tell us for the listeners who aren't familiar with the story, tell us a little bit more about um, Rob and Kurt. Yeah. Uh, well, Rob's been a customer for almost 10 years and when Washington State law uh, came for same-sex marriages, passed for same-sex marriages, uh, Rob came in and was talking to me about getting married. And before he got too far, I just told him that I couldn't do his wedding because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said he understood. We we just visited for a while. I, I asked him why they decided to get married after being so long together. That was Kurt and, and Rob. And uh, we talked about his mom walking him down the aisle. We just uh, we just chit-chatted for a while. And he asked if I would recon recommend another florist, which I did. Uh, and they got their flowers from that florist. Matter of fact, in the deposition, they had enough offers to do 23 weddings. And in the deposition, they were most gracious. They said they still considered me their florist. I had always treated them well. And uh, I had always been kind to them. So hmm. it was quite a shock when Kurt put something on Facebook. Hmm. So Kurt so put something on Facebook and, but he did, he didn't press charges against you or anything. How did, how did that come about? Like how did Washington state become involved in the ACLU? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when uh, Kurt put that on Facebook, he simply said, I have every right to believe the way I do, but it hurt their feelings. And from there it went viral. And so the attorney general picked it up without any complaint from Robert Kurt. And then a couple of weeks later, the ACLU also uh, got a hold of Kurt and Rob, and then they sued us both personally and corporately. Hmm. Okay, Bear now. So Rob and Kurt were a gay couple that you had been making flower arrangements for for years. And so what was different in this incident is that they were asking for a flower arrangement for their wedding that now same-sex uh, marriages were legal in Washington state. But as a Christian, we have certain views about weddings and their particular significance, right? And so can you talk to us about what, what was it about weddings that that you as a Christian thought, I can't, I can't make a special arrangement for something like that. Well, weddings symbolize the relationship between Christ and his church. And weddings are very involved. You spend months with the bride and groom, you get to know them, you get to know what they argue about, how they met, what their favorite color is, what they wanna convey at their wedding. Uh, it's very personal. And you want to create something that imitates what they want, that, that shows what they, the message they want to convey in the wedding of their love. So, you know, they say flowers aren't speech, but, you know, what do you do on Valentine's Day when you send roses? You know, you say, I love you. And when you send sympathy flowers, you're saying, I'm sorry. So there is a lot of speech in flowers. Flowers speak volumes of words. And when you go to the wedding and, Many times I'll help the bride get dressed, I'll sew a button on a tux. Uh, I greet the guest, I calm the parents, I help the bride get ready to walk down the aisle. Those are such personal things and such a sacred mm -hmm. ceremony that uh, for me to create something for Robin Kurt for their wedding is just something that I could not do. Mm. 
Yeah, I read an article that you wrote a couple years ago, a few years ago in the Seattle Times, and I loved how you described um, doing flowers and how you are an artist. And I'm not an artist, so I, but I loved what you said about it. And you said, for artists, creativity is the very core of who we are. And you said an artist really can't separate their work from their soul. And I, I loved that because it did, it did help me to understand you putting flowers together isn't just like when I go to Trader Joe's and buy flowers and stick it in a vase. This, you are an artist who puts your heart and soul into the flowers. And even how you just described how you participate in a wedding, I think most of us who aren't artists like you are with flowers don't understand that. But just hearing that brings so much clarity to why this was something that you said, oh, I just, as a believer, I can't participate in. Um, so that, even that explanation is so helpful for those of us, right, Sarah, who aren't yes. artists with flowers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. You have this lovely conversation with a friend, Rob. Then Kurt posts something just about having his feelings hurt on Facebook. And then all of a sudden, like there's a whole thing. So when did you realize, oh, this, first of all, this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, and I need some help. <laughs> when did you first realize this was actually going to be the next thing you were going to do is, is stand for what was right and participate in a lawsuit? When did you, when did that kind of first dawn on you that this was serious? Well, I had no idea that, I mean, Rob took it so gracefully and we ended with a hug that I had no idea. And I was home and we got a phone call. We had some company over and we got a phone call and they said, Baronelle, you're being sued. And I, I laughed. I said, for what? And that time I heard a knock on the door and here was the guy with the papers. Oh, wow. So that's how I, that's how I found out we were being sued. And then uh, I had, I've never been sued. I had no clue what to do. Uh, so I had a customer came in and said, you know, you need to get a hold of Alliance Defending Freedom. Hmm. And so we called them and they took the case. And I mean, we're talking millions of dollars here. I had no clue what to do, where to go, mm -hmm. uh, how to act, what to reply to, what not to reply to. I mean, it was pretty devastating because you have this attorney general for the state of Washington coming down and telling you, you will do weddings or I, I'm finding you and you will do weddings or else I'm going to destroy you. So it was, it was pretty tough. Mm. Baronel, have you, can you tell us about your family and your church and, and the community around you? Have you had a lot of um, people come around you and support you during these eight years of trials and, and all that you've gone through legally? Most of the people around here, because we are on the conservative side of Washington, have been very generous and very loving and kind. Of course, we've had the hate mail and the death threats and the bombing threats and all that that comes with this, but uh, we have just mm -hmm. been so blessed by our customers and people from all over the world. We've heard from 48 different countries. So we're just, we're just so thankful that people are encouraging us and uh, hopefully willing to stand up themselves. Mm -hmm. And have you been able to um, maintain contact with your friend Rob or I, has the legal stuff shut that down <laughs> legal stuff has pretty much shut that down I did yeah. uh, I saw Rob once at court but he was on the other side of the room and then I saw him at the deposition and I had again had never been sued so I didn't even know what a deposition was and when I went into the room they were introducing us to all these attorneys which there was a lot on the ACLU side Washington side and uh, then they said, oh, you know, Rob. And I looked up and I said, Rob, can I hug you? And he said, yes. So he went around one side of the table and I went around the other. Aww. And we hugged each other. And uh, that was the, other than the Supreme Court, that was the last time I saw him. Wow. And, but there was a story that you told us um, when we recently saw you, John and I, uh, about the vases. Can you tell that story? Like it. It was kind of like a symbol of maybe there's still friendship there. 
Yeah, Rob worked for a company and they got a lot of uh, bases uh, returned. And he called me one day and he said, you know, we're, if you don't take these bases or you want these bases because otherwise we're going to have to destroy them. And I said, sure, I'll take them. So he sent me pallets of bases probably every two months. And uh, we recycled them and used them. And then when the lawsuit came, the pallets of vases still came. And when they would drop them off, I would say, tell Rob hi. Hmm. And they would say, yeah. And I just thought that was sort of Rob's way of saying, you know, we're good. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of you. But, but, you know, that stopped in about six months. And I'm, I'm sure that was probably told him to stop. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably so. So Bear, now you were sued by the ACLU, you were sued by Washington State, and you have gone through over the past eight years, different trials, and, and your case ended up in the Supreme Court because Washington State ruled against you and said that you were discriminating against, um, against Rob and Kurt, even though you weren't discriminating against them as people, there was just an event that you didn't want to participate um, in. And this is why Alliance Defending Freedom has jumped in because of this is a religious liberty case. And um, so a couple weeks ago, you got the sad news that the Supreme Court wouldn't take up your case. So I guess I'm just wondering how, how are you doing? Um, and, and even maybe more specifically, how has your faith journey been these past eight years as you've had times where it's looked hopeful that you might not be, you know, the lawsuit might not go through. And then now it, it looks like it will go through. So could you share with our listeners just how your faith with the Lord has been during these eight years of trials and struggles and not knowing what the future is going to be? Well, I can't say it hasn't been difficult, but I can say that God's promises are true. And I believe that in a sovereign God, I believe that he's totally in control and it's my job to be obedient. And if I am obedient, then he will take care of the rest. <laughs> and he has proven that to be true. Uh, everything we own is his. So if he wants to use that, however, then we're okay with that. Berna, I really appreciate your posture towards, um, this whole process and just how it is a sacrifice. I mean, it's a sacrifice to say, I'm going to stand for this because this is truth and, and, and this is worth standing for. And I mean, we know that it's costing you and your family a lot and um, praise God that you have that assurance that you are, you are the Lord's you're his daughter. And the things that he's given you are truly a gift, but doesn't make it any less challenging to face the idea of losing so much. Um, so I'd love for you to just talk about the cost that you're, that you faced and that you are, that you are going to face and then, and then why that's worth it. Well, there has, you know, when I say everything we have is the Lord's, it is, but there is cost to standing up and some of the, the things that we've excuse me <clears throat> some of the things we faced have been phone calls and letters and people coming in that have been absolutely vile mm -hmm. and disgusting and we've been threatened with bombings we've been threatened with computers we've been threatened with picketing uh, people threatening to kill us I've had to change the way I went to work. We got a security system. We've notified the police. I mean, I, I've had to go around the block three times to make sure that I haven't been followed. Mm. When people come up to me in the parking lot and bang on my window, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether to roll down the window or leave it up or dive mm. from the dash floor. If we, when we find out what the ACLU attorney fees will be, it could be that we lose our home, mm. our business, our life savings, everything we save for, for our kids and our grandkids, simply because 
I have a different viewpoint on marriage. Our freedoms are being taken away and there is a cost, but there's more of a cost if we don't stand up. Hmm. Unpack that a little bit. What do you mean by there's more of a cost if we don't stand up? Everything we know now as our faith, our freedoms, our constitution is slowly being taken away piece by piece. And because we're Christians, we want to be loving, we want to be kind. But, you know, Jesus was, was spit upon, he was kicked out of town. He was called names, he wasn't politically correct. But yet he still loved, but he still stood. And he is our example to stand. Bear, now, how can all of us listening right now, how, how can we pray for you as this case um, has yeah, gone to the Supreme Court? They're not going to hear your case. Um, and you're in kind of a waiting period right now of kind of last things being tied up, but how, how could our listeners pray for you and your family? Well, I just pray that God gives us the strength and the obedience to stand strong. Pray for our churches, right? That our churches would begin to rise up and, and realize that we need to be obedient to Christ's word. Pray for Kurt and Rob mm. through this also, that, uh, yeah, that's. Well, I really, I really appreciate you sharing all of that, Baronel, and it's such a challenge to all of us. And I hope our listeners will really take this to heart. And I pray that I take this to heart too. That um, you know, in the in America, we're hesitant to call what's going on persecution, but it's funny the people that have lived under persecution are saying, no, this is absolutely persecution. And it's not at the level that some countries face, but this is persecution. And um, so we are grateful for the example that you've set for us of not only standing for what is true, but doing it with such compassion. And I just think there could not be a sweeter and more awesome and a little feisty example for us <laughs> that, that you've set. And I just want you to know that as Christians in America, we're indebted to you and the, and the sacrifice that you've already made and continue to make. And I want you to know that there are a lot of us praying for you. And um, I also want you to know that you're a hero in our family and that John just just thinks that my husband just talks about you all the time. So you continue to get new prayer partners because he continues to talk about you and everybody's <laughs> like, man, that woman's awesome. You know, anyway, but I wanted to just, I wanted to put in a funny thing too, because, um, Kelly sent your, your lawyer sent us, um, the, the note that your grandson wrote. So yeah. remember in the story listeners that the Supreme court denied seeing Baronel's case, which means she's facing, potentially facing huge amounts of money, like fees and all that. And, and uh, I don't know all the technical terms. I'll just leave it at that. She's facing uh, like the loss of a lot of things. Um, and her grandson, Asher, who's nine, right, Baronel? Yes. Writes the Supreme Court a note. And I just have to read it for you because it was my favorite. It's just amazing. Okay. He says, dear Supreme Court, do you realize what you're doing? If Baronel has no house, there will be no cousin camp. Love, <laughs> love. I love that. Love, Asher. P.S. I am so disappointed. <laughs> I just thought that was the best, like from the mouth of a young person, like, that's amazing. But you just have to tell us about Cousin Camp because you have 25 grandchildren. How on earth do you do that? Well, we have Cousin Camp every year and there's usually 10 to 12 cousins that come and I just have to tell the parents to drop them off and don't come back for a week. And uh, we just have a, <laughs> we have a great time. We have mud fights. We do slip and slide. We bake cookies. We have birthdays. And uh, 
we sit out on the deck on the patio and just talk about life and they're just a joy and at eight o'clock at night I said I don't care if you're tired or not you're all going to bed so <laughs> they all lay down on the floor and we put a, a appropriate video on and they all watch it till they drop off to sleep so it's just a great time I love that okay I want to be a grandma just like you but I'm not I do too. I'm, I'm so not confident that I will be but <laughs> You're an example to us on all kinds of levels, like stand for free, you know, stand for truth and love your grandkids and yes. throw mud at them and let them throw it at you. And all Absolutely. Stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Drop the kids off and get out of here. I want my grandkids. Yeah. I love it. That's so great. And I just love his, do you realize what you're doing Supreme Court? Do you realize? Yes. I mean, that's what all Cousin of us camp feel like. is in jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A nine-year-old gets it, but. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So on that note, Bear, now you, you have young people all around you with all these grandkids. So in our podcast, we have listeners who are junior high, high school, college age, um, women who are listening right now. So we love to always ask our guests if they have advice for young people growing up today. So I, you are full of wisdom. So I would love to hear what advice you would have for our younger listeners. Well, we certainly never know what God's going to give us. And I'm a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that if you're willing to stand, if God gives, God will give you the talent, he will open the doors. He will amaze you with what he gives you if you're willing to be obedient. Mm -hmm. So with whatever he asks you to do, if you're willing, he'll take care of you. His mm. promises are true. And don't be afraid to stand up for your Christ, for your principles, for your constitution. It's our obligation to do that. And you are our next generation. We need you to take over. Mm. Mm. All right, Bear. Now, we love to talk about books on, on the podcast. Do you have a favorite book or one you're reading right now? Either one. I just finished Jack Phillips' book, The Baker, that was sued for that not making the oh, same yeah. sex wedding cake, and yeah. it's called The Cost of My Faith, and it is an excellent book. He's he's right on on what we're trying to say. So, and it's real easy reading. So if you you need a book to read, that's the one to go to. Yeah, that's oh, a great, great recommendation. recommendation. Yeah, and you guys have oh. walked very similar paths too. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Bernal, last question is if you could have coffee or tea with any woman in history, who would you love to sit down with and have a conversation? You know, this sounds probably a little weird, but it would be Mary. When I think of Jesus's mother and when they came to her when she was 14 or 15, told her she was going to have the savior of the world, I mean, I can't imagine what your feelings would be like, what, you know, me, who, what, <laughs> it would just go on and on. And then to have, to have a Christ child and see him crucified, hmm. what must that have been like? You know, I just, I just can't imagine what this young woman went through in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Yeah. We've had many <laughs> people say that. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because everybody has just a few different kinds of questions that they would ask Mary. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But I love that. Well, bear now, I just want you to know that Aaron and I and our families are praying for you. Mm -hmm. And I know that our listeners are, are going to be praying for you as well. And we just can't thank you enough for being willing to spend this time with us and share your story it has been my blessing thank you so much for taking the time <laughs>